Ah, well, dang, what happened? <gasps> Let's try this again. <gasps> Boom! Oh, much better. So, hi, welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne. Discombobulated Monday and, you know, Quindy and her servitors, John and Justin. Hey, yeah, it's Monday. And yeah, this it's, it's, is Canadian Thanksgiving is this coming weekend though, right? Am I right? Am I wrong? Like I have Canadian friends and they mentioned it, but I thought it was weekend. Yes, me. Exactly. Oh, it's today. Okay. Well, dang. Huh. I hope I didn't miss a board meeting then. <laughs> Man, I'm just like, wee, my brain's way out here somewhere. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. My brain is gone. So hi, everybody. Today, we're painting in Genie. And today, we're going to do some pastels. Yay, pastels. Um, and uh, since I did a cold blue and a cold pink for the female Genie that we worked on, um, I thought I would do a warm blue and a peach for this guy. So doing more of a, a greeny blue and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a peach, which should go very, very well together because they're complementary colors. So to start our peach, we're going to grab lotus orange, which is itself kind of a coral color. Um, I'm going to grab also some magma red for when I want to mix that in. So we're going to kind of build a peach off of uh, magma red and the new, I don't have my, don't have my actual labeled one like right next to me, but you guys get the idea. Lotus orange. Ah, and for the greeny blue, bluey green, um, tropical blue is a very warm blue. And I'm going to lighten it. I think with a bit of spectral glow. Spectral glow is kind of a pastel, um, pastel teal anyway. So I'm gonna essentially maybe I'll build some shadows with this, or I'll mix a little bit of my tropical and my spectral. Um, I don't. I was actually thinking kind of a peach turban actually. I was thinking peach, but let's actually look at color composition because oh no, I forgot my glasses. Okay, we'll look at color composition when I grab my glasses. Alrighty. Much better. Now I can see things. Seeing things is uh, is not overrated. So first we have to think about um, some obvious things. For example, we know that the smoke here is uh, probably going to be, probably we're going to go more with a teal with that. Or we could also do a color shift, but I'm thinking that we're going to start out with at least with a teal here. Um, if we start out with a teal here, then that means that these cloth bits hanging down over the blue teal need to be coral. Um, then we should look at kind of our color composition here. Uh, the edging here might be gold. We might have silver for the, uh, the plates. I may do metallics on this actually, um, thinking about it because there's a lot of metal. Um, it would kind of detract from the etherealness to do that. But he looks pretty solid, all things considered. He's not nearly as ethereal as our female genie was, where she was definitely, like, amorphous. Um, a lot of her was. So, and then I have to kind of look up here and say, all right, so if his uh, cloth bits are there, then the sash around his waist is probably uh, coral or, or peach. Um, the little armor bit above that, I can go with a bit of blue there. So I'm going to go blue... Peach, peach, blue. I may do blue on these little canisters, whatever they are. Um, if we're going to do peach on this, we're going to probably do blue on the bottle. So again, we're, we're uh, totally um, switching back and forth. I may go for more of a pure blue, more of a pure tropical blue on the bottle, just to make it a little bit different. Um, and then we go up here. We've got a bracer and the turban. And uh, the turban is mostly one piece, but he does have the little uh, ribbon bit on the front. And so whatever color I make the turban, I can accent with the ribbon bit. 
But right now I'm thinking about a peach turban with a, a blue teal uh, ribbon and blue teal uh, bracer. Um, that's what I'm kind of feeling. And again, I may come down here and make this bracer also blue teal. Um, the blade itself is going to probably have some sky reflection in it. Uh, again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking metallics. Uh, no, actually, that doesn't solve the problem, though, Pendrake. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the, and, and it's not, I mean, this kind of armor is typically metallic. But, uh, but no, because boiled leather is also going to look very earthy and solid. Like, no matter which way, it's going to be that way. Um, so I probably will go metallic with it, because that's kind of the way that I was feeling it. Um, I don't want to do NMM on all these scales, for one thing. It would take forever, and you guys get so bored. Um because it's all just the same thing. Pardon me, found mold line. Must, must remove. Um, and uh, I'll probably just go with the silver scales and maybe I'll mix some colors into them to make it a little more ethereal. It's easier to do that kind of uh, special effect with NMM because you can control everything. Metallics are gonna look like metal no matter really what you do to them. They can look like magical metal, but they're still gonna look really metallic. But since this guy is generally uh, looks pretty solid anyway, as I mentioned, it's not a big deal to continue painting him solid. Uh, he's pretty much like coming to life out of the lamp, in my opinion. So uh, it's all it's okay to paint him as, as more corporeal. Just kind of getting some of this mold line off. But yeah, so I mean. Think about the reasoning before you, uh, before you like, you know, like if, if, if it already is going to, if the metallics are going to make it look more corporeal, leather is also going to make it look that way. But his skin is very corporeal anyway, since we did not go with like very ethereal colors for it. So yeah, in, in the end, it probably doesn't matter. And I should just go with what I wanted to do, which was shaded metallics. There we go. Ah, ah. Sometimes one's black gets little plastic boogers and it's very annoying. Just saying. Just saying, Bones Black. Just saying. Plastic boogers. Not into your plastic boogers. All right. And then I'm going to actually take a little sculpting tool to it and just kind of get those boogers off of there. There. Yep, plastic boogers. It is what it is. There we go. That's a little better. Okie dokie. So I think that's pretty much the comp I'm going with. Uh, it also works here because then the turban is going to be the peach for the most part. And so if the blade has some blue in it, um, those are going to go together just fine. Uh, down here I can do blue with the backer and do the big gems in peach and gold, uh, which would help to alternate. So we can do that. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking, guys. Yeah, mold snot, right, Bruce? Yeah. I like plastic boogers better, but that's just me. All right, so the only thing about making pastels, guys, is really just pick a color that does not have any black in it. Pick as, as bright or as, like, um, unmuted a color uh, as you can, unless, of course, it's muted with white, in which case you've already got a pastel. Pastels are just, like, colors that are tinted. They're just uh, colors that are, are muted with white. Um, but if you pick something that has any black in it that isn't a bright color, your pastels are going to look more like muted grayed out colors. That's not what a pastel is. Um, when you tint with white, you actually retain a lot of the brightness of the color, a lot of the saturation of the color. If you're going to mute a color but still want it to be fairly vibrant, you should use white. Um, you can also, in some colors, use black, like with blues, and still retain a lot of the... Uh, vibrancy of the color if you don't use too much black. Black does tend to kill the vibrancy of a color, uh, makes it very not bright, especially if you add both white and black, then it's done. Uh, so yeah. So first of all, I'm going to just do like uh, two drops of my orchid, or sorry, my lotus orange. And I'm going to add a drop of white to it and kind of assess the color and see if it's the color I really want in my head. Let me get a pokey tool out here. I'm going to start blocking stuff in. So 
So lotus orange is, is definitely a coral. It's, uh, it's got a fair amount of red in it, and it's got white. It has an orange shade yellow, which gives it slightly better coverage than if we'd gone with a greener yellow. But when you're building oranges, you usually want to go with an orange shade yellow. Anyway, for obvious reasons, I'm going to pop a drop of white in there. Gosh, my paints are all over the freaking place today. They are everywhere. I thought I did a good job of putting them away until I like looked and went, whoa. Whoa, my paints have exploded all everywhere. There we go. It's a little better. There. I do like to at least make an attempt to keep my area clean. Now, when you add white to this, you're going to see if there is any black in the color. Adding white to a color is usually uh, the way that if I don't know what's in a color, I'll add white to it and see. Usually I'll be able to tell if it goes slightly gray, I'll know there's black in there. Um, if it stays really bright, I'll know it's more of a pure color. So that gives us a pale orange with a little bit of red in it, but not with a lot. So I think I am going to use a drop of magma. I wanted a little more pink. There. Magma is orangey, very orangey red, but it has a lot of red pigment in it. So we're going to pop that in there. And then we're going to grab... That's a good uh, mid-range uh, color. You don't want to start super light because you still want to be able to highlight it. So don't add as much white as you might feel inclined to. You're always going to be highlighting it. It will come up uh, higher. Now, this is still pretty orange. And if we really wanted to, to more shade it toward pink, um, we could go with just a little bit more of our clear red. Now, somebody, I believe, on the Discord was complaining that when they did peaches, uh, they just kept looking like skin tones. If your peach that you're mixing looks like a skin tone, it's almost a certain sign that you have another pigment in there, black or blue or green, that's been used to uh, to essentially tint, uh, or not tint, to, to modify the uh, pink or the red and orange uh, pigments. Um, like, it shouldn't look, this does not look like a skin tone. Like, you could maybe use this as, like, you know, if I added some red to it, you could use it as a blush color maybe. But I'm going to add just a tiny touch of clear red. I want it a little more pink. There we go. That's more like what I want. Um, but yeah, if you start, if you try to mix a coral color or a, a salmon color or a, or a peach and you, and you feel like, no, this is like, there we go. So you guys can really see the color. Um, I know this feels like a skin tone. That is a sure sign that you've got something else in there. Because the way we build skin tones is usually with using uh, a yellow and a red and a blue, green, or black, uh, plus white. So, But you need that blue, green, or black, or it's going to just look like peaches. Like, it's just going to look peach. Uh, no, it's too vibrant for that, Ancient Marble. This is, this is really, I'm really trying to make a point here that this is not usable as a skin tone. So if you, if you are really feeling like the color you've mixed is a skin tone, then there's definitely something else in there besides red and yellow and white. So uh, it's, it's coming off a little washed out on the camera, but it's quite um, vibrant in person. So this is really something to take to heart when you're mixing pastels. It, they should still, still be a pretty bright, unnaturally bright color. Like it should look like a fabric color, not ever a skin color. Um, and the only other way that you could get, uh, you know, try to mix this kind of orange peach and have it look like a skin color it, without using a blue or a green or a black is if you were using um, opposing pigments. So like if you were using a, a green shade yellow, say, with lemon yellow, so you're not using, you should always use an orangey yellow if you can, like lantern or candlelight. Um, but if you're using a greeny yellow and like, uh, say, a magenta, like a bluish red pigment. So you're trying to mix these instead. This will create an orange, but because you have a, a greenish and a, a bluish, like you're, you're using like kind of opposing pigments, um, it will mute slightly and it may actually approach a skin tone color. So when you're mixing an orange, use, uh, 
like use your common sense and choose a red that is warmer, not colder, and a yellow that is orangier. Yeah, but again, this making this point to answer uh, answer that um, comment that I saw where you know peach always looks like skin tones, but it really doesn't, it really doesn't. And if it really does to you, um, take a color blindness test because that can cause colors to modify in your in your eyes. And sometimes the shift is subtle, and you 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 know you may not even notice it if you're very slightly colorblind. So. There are an awful lot. This is a very starfish color, yes. Um, this is, I, I say that not to like, you know, not to like uh, be rude Kodiak, but because there are a lot of colorblind mini painters out there. Like maybe you guys don't realize, but there are a lot of them, including high level competition winners. Um, it's very, first, I mean, it's, it's common in the population, but I think because it's mini painting, like you maybe notice it uh, or your friends notice it when you paint. So... I mean, there is possibly, like, one of my friends, like, discovered his colorblindness completely by accident through miniature painting and just, like, talking about, like, the color of my dog. Like, he had no idea until I was like, that's not what color my dog is, and you're, this color scheme looks odd to me, you know? And then he finally took a test and discovered that he was colorblind. And he had just, it had never come up in his life previous because he hadn't done anything artistic and he just wasn't prone to discussing colors of stuff. So. All right. So let's uh, block this in, see how it looks against the skin tone. The skin tone I chose is fairly uh, neutral. Now you can see the lack of coverage here. Um, and so one thing I may decide to do, because I think, unfortunately, I've thinned this because I thin everything. Um, I thinned a lot. So one thing I could do is put some white down if I wanted to, but I'll probably just do two coats. Yeah, it's a, uh, I just, I encounter an awful lot of people in the hobby who are. One second, guys. Another little tiny mold line bit that I missed. Just gonna take that off. This is the nice thing about painting on bonus material is that you know if you do need to stop and remove a mold line, it's not like you have to reprime. Because in my case, I didn't prime in the first place. There. I'm using a slightly bigger brush for base coating, but not a huge one. I'm, I'm using a Reaper Kalinsky Zero. Uh, hello, green users. I'm going to pop my palette out here, get in, focus in. Yeah, there we go. And we'll just start approach, start putting on our, our coral color, our peach color. And I'll be shading this, but I'm going to put down a base first. Um, this is a little, weirdly, it's not like super self-leveling right now. So I kind of feel like, even though I thinned it, and this is just, again, like the fact that Lotus Orange is, um, is a very intense color means that its coverage is not perfect. It's not awesome. There we go. That's better. I want it I want it to be very fluid. I don't want it to show brush strokes. So even if I have to put on a couple of coats. They labeled all the wiring, yeah. That's not bad. I'm going to just use this kind of as a proof of concept. I'm going to do the turban here in this peach. I'm going to add the blue um, ribbon up here. And I'm going to kind of uh, assess, like see how it looks. Probably a blue gem in the middle too. I'll probably go with the tealy color I want on the ribbon and a darker blue for the gem. And I'm putting this on fairly thick because it is thinned. Um, you guys can see that it is pretty watery, but I'm having no problems with it sticking to the model. This is why I wash my models. I find that it helps with this because I do like to use a thin base coat with bones. 
And as we all know, sometimes bones right out of the package can be a little hydrophobic, so I was washed with dish soap. Dish soap is actually a very strong soap. Um, that's why they, uh, this is, this is funny, but I was actually reading up on what to use to wash your car if you don't want to actually purchase like car soap. And they're like, dish soap, don't, do, don't use dish soap ever because it's way too powerful. So uh, that could be why dish soap is so good at taking any um, leftover like mold release or whatever off of the bones. Alrighty, so we'll let that dry and we'll mix up our blue that we want. Yeah, my friend had uh, yellow interference colorblindness, so anything that was yellow mixed with another color looked great. There's all sorts of different kinds of it. Alrighty, I'm going to use Spectral Glow with just a little bit of Tropical Blue in it to set up kind of, uh, I'm going to do it right next to the peach color too so I can judge how well they go together. Now by going more toward the pink with my peach, I have gone away from uh, making this these colors perfectly complementary. They're a little bit off from each other, but they are still opposite each other on the color wheel, so they're still probably going to be just fine. Ah, and Spectral Glow decided to all come out at once. Blorf. Um, Twisted Oma, they just pop. When your paint is watery, like this, bubbles don't matter. Like, if your paint self-levels like this, those bubbles are just going to pop. This is real thin. See it? You can see through it right there a little bit. This is the consistency I like my base coats. But I don't even have to blow on those bubbles to pop them. They just pop. If you are using really thick paint, you can run into problems where the bubbles don't always pop. But they have to be pretty thick. So if you're having problems with bubbles, either... When you put, see your bubbles, just blow on them if they bother you. I, I just never really need to. Yeah, I mean, that's because of the surfactants that are holding the paint together. Surfactants are also used in, guess what, dish soap. And they're what makes the, guess what, suds. So when you see bubbles in paint, that's the surfactant action. Surfactants are chemicals that hold together everything else in the paint. I'm going to use a little more blue, and we'll see how this turns out. Our blue and our blue. Again, this is looking really much lighter on camera than it is in person. Sometimes that just happens. But yeah, the bubbles thing is just something that's it's another don't overthink it. It's uh, like like you can see that bubble that th in that thick paint bubble. Even that will probably lightly pop, likely pop, but it might take a while, and so you might get a rim. But only in like really thick paint does it matter. I might go a little greener with this. Where's my greens? I might go a little greener. I might try. And I have a choice. I'm going to try to use a little Naga, though. Um, I could try to use, like, Dungeon Slime or something like that, but it wouldn't bring a lot of pigment to it. A lot of people ask me about bubbles on their paint jobs, and really the answer is if it's really thin paint, don't even worry about it. But if it really bothers you, there we go. I'm going to tint it a little greener. Interesting. I'm trying to decide if I like it a little greener or a little bluer. I thought I was going to like it greener, but now I'm second-guessing myself. Hmm. Now I feel like I want it more blue. So instead, we'll go the other way. 
Now, one of the things about these colors is that they are both very similar in uh, shade, right? They're both that pastel color. So we don't have one that's noticeably lighter, lighter and we don't have one that's noticeably darker. And this will make them not go together quite as well. Even though they're complements, and they should go together great, they may not, you know, seem to go great just because they don't have enough, like, they, they could use a little more difference. Like, if, if the blue was a little darker, it would look better. So it isn't just, like, color. Like, if you can use, like, colors that are complements or, or near complements or that are in a triad, but if they're all around the same, uh oh, I think I put the wrong cap on something. There we go. Um, if they're all around the same shade, then they're like not going to look as good as if you also use an additional additional form of contrast. Hold on, I've got to rinse out a paint cap that I unfortunately. I don't want my water paint, uh, my, my water bottle cap to have pigment in it, so I have to clean out my mistake here for a second before it dries. No, his skin tones are what they are. He looks darker on camera right now, Twisted Oma, because my camera is uh, using the white, the white here. The cameras definitely adjust their white balance uh, depending on what's in frame, and that's why I keep the big black base here. Because if I put the big black base behind him and move this out of frame, his skin tones look lighter. So it's all just like visual illusion. It's, uh, it's the one way, much as I love this camera, no camera is perfect. And uh, so if you stream or you're shooting a video, you're, you're almost never going to get perfect color balance. There we go. Much better. Sorry, had to get had to get all the green out of my uh, my water bottle cap. My mistake. All right, but yeah. So this is just the camera adjusting, and it's going to make this paint look lighter and the other paint look lighter as well. So just a reminder, everybody, uh, my wedding is this weekend, and I will not be on on Thursday, Friday, Monday, or Tuesday. I will return. I will be on Wednesday this week, and I will return on the following Wednesday. Yeah, I think I'm going to shade this with blue. I think it's going to go a little bit better. I think I'll pull the um, pull that pastel a bit darker depending on how it dries we'll see we'll see how it dries i'm going to grab my just tropical blue maybe we end up using tropical blue instead and we end up highlighting with the spectral i will not be on saturday that is my wedding weekend kodiak and i have um family in town so there is no way i will be able to stream on saturday I will be uh, buried under relatives, trying hard, like, not to completely stress out. Yeah, well, I don't enjoy family get-togethers usually, Vistanoma, so this is all, this is the problem with having an actual wedding. Um, I would much rather have eloped, but, you know, it's David's only wedding. It's like his, you know, he'd never been married previously, unlike me, so we are doing it for the fams. And it'll be nice to have people out here in the Bay Area, and it'll be nice for them to finally see our house. No, no, actually, Vic, money is not the thing. The thing we have to avoid in my family is politics. Big time. Big time. Money is not the, not the forbidden topic in our families. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's like certain topics off limits. That is the one. So there's our blue. Yeah, once I have the blue in, I like it a lot better. Now I'm kind of rethinking. I'm thinking maybe I use the blue as a bridging color and I add in touches of the turquoise. I think that might be the way to go because I'm not enjoying the way that these went together as much as I thought I would. So yeah. 
So yeah, let's try doing the blue instead. Tropical blue is one of my favorite blues. I'm probably going to enjoy it a little better. Uh, Twisted Oma, I am not going to answer uh, at all. Um, if I do, I, I, I believe, okay, so I need to, I'm going to be like publishing my novels. I need to not publicize my actual last name. Um, as a writer, you can't, it's not like with, with Becker, which is my old married name. Like that's pretty safe. There's tons of, tons of Beckers in the world, but, uh, like for safety's sake, when you put yourself out there, if I get any degree of like notice when I put out my books, like it's a no, I, I need to, uh, not answer that question. Like, one of the first things they teach you in the writing conference I went to is don't use your actual name for your writer's name for that reason. Especially if you're a woman. Hate to say it, but true. Yeah, it's just not safe. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I'm going to change my name. I don't know if I'm going to change it back to my, my maiden, my old maiden name, which David told me is, like, perfectly cool with him. Um... So, yeah, y'all can just wonder. <laughs> Maybe I'll just change it to something totally crazy. Um, let's see here. Let's use, you know, I'm actually, yeah, I'll use Rogue Liner, but I'm going to have to thin it a lot. Where's my Rogue Liner? Rogue Liner, where did you go? There it is, Rogue Shadow. I keep calling it Rogue Liner, and it's Rogue Shadow, but you guys get the idea. Yeah, right. I could call myself anything. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. I would not be the first woman who has just, like, chosen a name that she really liked and changed it to that. David doesn't care as long as I don't keep my old married name. Like, he, I, could, I could change it to, like, you know, like, Starbright, and, uh, and he wouldn't care. <laughs> Alrighty. Yeah, I'm sure I could I could use all sorts of, you know, like random name generators and come up with something. Keeping Anne though, guys. I'm kind of fond of Anne. I'm not changing Anne. Like, I mean, I use pen names. Absolutely, I'll use pen names and change the name there. But yeah, my actual name is going to stay Anne. Thank you. I'm very fond of Anne. It's not a very common name these days. I feel like we're a special breed, you know, especially the ands with an E, but you know, we also allow those other ands into the club. I'm just gonna bring in my Rogue Shadow. I wanna do a little lining. David's mom didn't change her name. She kept her, uh, she kept her maiden name. And I'll still be using Forcer as my painting, painting nom, nom de paint, nom de brush, which I've been doing all these years anyway, even after I did change my name officially. Oh no, I'm already on that, Bruce. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. I always knew I was going to be using initials. I always wanted to use initials. It's another part of that anonymity thing. And you'd, uh, you'd be surprised. No, Bruce, you, you'd be surprised. Like, it's a, totally a thing. Like, that's why, especially if you see a woman writing science fiction, it's always initials. And, and the publishing industry forced people to do that uh, for many, many years. Like, that was a thing. That's why when you look at C.S. Friedman and, and uh, C.J. Cherry and uh, a bunch of other women who have... Uh, written fantasy and sci-fi and they all have initials that is why and you will especially notice it 
if you are uh, if you have the temerity as a female to write a male main character like Harry Potter why do you think JK is JK and it is uh, a sad thing that they used to impose that on people but I always kind of wanted to be initials because I thought initials were much more dignified and some of my favorite writers are initials writers, so I feel like I'm in good company. Although uh, it depends on like how my career goes forward, because if I start writing, I'm writing young adult right now, and if I decide to write adult uh, like urban fantasy or something, I'll change to a different different name, and I'll probably keep a female name in that case. But no more than two pen names. Because I don't know how people freaking keep track of all of them. Some of these people who write in like four or five different genres and have like three or four different pen names. I'm like, how do you even, how do you even remember who you're supposed to be at a convention? <laughs> uh, Anne McCaffrey being a definite exception, Hendrick. I'm not why, I'm not sure why they let her get away with it, except that she was definitely writing like, she was writing about dragons. And so they didn't take her as, as a hard sci-fi, you know, like. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, that would be a question for, like, like uh, her son maybe might know. I'm not certain if she ever talked about it. But a lot of Anne McCaffrey's books were also very romance-heavy, like, in a way. And so I don't know if they... I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I'm not sure why. Yeah, right. Yeah, romance genre still doesn't get respect, even though it's the, the best-selling genre in the world. Romance uh, is sells more and makes more money than any other genre. Mystery and thriller is second. And I believe... I think literature's third and sci-fi fantasy is, is fourth. I think. Don't quote me on that. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, Bernie's Mountain Dog Zoomies, yep. Yeah. I get I get afraid enough when Kiki Zoomies come out because the teeth come out right after that. Bernie's Mountain Dog Zoomies, though, feel like they would just level your house. But yes, Kiki, uh... Kiki Zoomies are bad enough. We gave her a, we gave her a bath and it, it, it brought out Zoomies and teeth. I did, I did, despite my best efforts, I did get a new Kiki scar, but it's a very small one. I was trying to, uh, to get all my scars to heal up before the wedding, but I don't know if I'm going to manage. <laughs> don't know if I'm going to manage, but she did get baffed. She did get baffed yesterday. I didn't get pictures because I was too busy trying to uh, control the, the wild dingo that came out when we baffed her. I did not get quite as soaked as the first time. Uh, mostly because I think David was better at, at wrangling her in the bathtub. So I'm putting another coat on here. I'm um, just doing some lining to kind of separate stuff out. Yeah, horror genre is pretty uh, equitable, I think, uh, as far as male-female. Uh, Kiki does not love her water time. Kiki wants to get out of the tub and spray you with water in the process. Kiki loves to like play in water on her own, of her own volition, but does not like being uh, being uh, immersed in water. Oh, I've got news for him, but I mean, it's not. I mean, you still got. You, it still takes time to heal. So, I have a big ugly one on my arm from like the start of last week. That's slowly closing but yeah i'm getting some serious scars from this puppy like i can see him it's gonna be a while i don't know if i'm ever gonna get rid of those kiki may have scarred me for life my poor skin oh my god yeah lady yeah it would be an earthquake you're right some always like seem to have more impact than they should because they're like solid little dogs 
Kiki's always also a pretty solid little dog. David's like, no, she's skinny after we put her in the tub. And I'm like, she's not as skinny as some dogs I've known. Kiki, Kiki is not like a total chonk, but she's got some chonkness going on. You guys have all seen the chonk meme with the cats, right? Because I that's totally hilarious, and da I, made, I made David send it to me. Because there are so many be wonderful cat people on this stream. And it's an old meme, so sometimes that means you don't, you know, you haven't seen it. If you're not, like, super on the internet. Hey, Jen. Like, the chonk meme is awesome. Love the chonk meme. Hold on. Hold on, I'm going to share for those of you who are, who are not. It's the Chonkers classification chart. It's this, the cat weight chart. And you have a fine boy. And then you have he chonk. And then you have a heckin' chonker. And then you have hefty chonk. Then you have mega chonker. And finally you say it. You have, oh lord, he coming. <laughs> The chonk meme is awesome. Yes. So that was that was just special. A special delivery chonk meme for those of you. I would say that uh I would say I would say chonk. I would say like, you know, chonk. Uh just like the 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 slight chonk for for uh Keekster. She's not fat, she just got a little bit Yeah, oh lord, he coming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. I have seen a lot of very fat cats in my time, so, and some seriously fat dogs, because I because I have a large breed, and so people are so I just don't get it. I do I do not get the whole, um, you know, there have been a couple of Shilohs like in history, that have been 140 pound dogs, like legit 140 pound dogs, but because that like, you know, people hold that up and admire it. People who have dogs that are really not supposed to be that weight overfeed them just so they can be boasty about having a 140-pound dog when really their poor dog ought to be 110 pounds and it's 30 pounds overweight. I feel so bad about it. That's why actually we um, we removed... There used to be in the breed standard, there used to be weights, like a weight range, and we removed it because people would get obsessive about it. That's that's one thing that Jim Ludwig ought to do for his animal uh, his animal line. He ought to have his chonkers. Chonkers the night. All right, so I like that I like that coral actually quite a bit now that I've got it on there more solid. It just needed a little bit of extra coating. I'm gonna put blue on the bracer and see how that looks. Yeah, the chonk. Uh, I don't, Bruce, because sometimes the human side is terrible for a breed standard. <laughs> but yes, in this case, in this case, um, we really just didn't want to encourage that sort of thing. So we didn't put an official range. A lot of our dogs are, are quite solid at between 80 and 110. Um, that's still a big dog. It's been a while since I've had a Shiloh in the house, and I'm, I like, I keep looking at Kiki and going, "You're really big." <laughs> how did I forget how big these dogs were? Oh, beagles, yeah. Because they don't get enough exercise, too, right, Dog Father? Like, it's like a smaller dog, and people, I think, dachshunds suffer the same thing, right? They actually need a, a fair bit of exercise, but because they're smaller, they maybe don't get it. Um, yeah, that's a shame. But yeah, the thing I don't like about the human side and how breed standards evolve is when uh, the humans uh, write the uh, faults into the standard because they've essentially lost all the correct dogs in their breed or the or the fault is so ubiquitous that they just put it into the standard. Um, and that's part of that is, I guess, not their fault because like with your, if you're an AKC breed, you can't outcross like we are to get back correct tails or correct whatever, right? Yeah. Oh, they have no off switch for food. 
Oh, yeah, you can't just free feed. Got it, got it. Yeah, I didn't know that about beagles. Interesting. I guess labs can be like that too, huh? I have heard that labs will pretty much eat anything. I don't know if they have a, a food off switch. So yeah, so looking at color composition now, um, it's just kind of pleasing. I like it. Um, I'm debating putting a colored stripe through the turban. I don't know, though. That's not my... I, I think it would get into too much trouble. I'm going to try to like use some interesting shading instead, I think. So all right, let's, uh, let's get this peach down here. Let's travel it down the model. Trash compactors, yeah. I think it was the breed that I had read about was Bichon's, uh, Bichon Frise, Frise? Um, the French breed, the little white dogs. They have umbilical hernias uh, pretty much in like 75% of the breeds, so they actually wrote it into the breed standard so that judges wouldn't um, mark them down on it. And that's sad. I don't know if that's still the case or if an effort was made, but I remember reading about that in one of my dog books and was like, really? What? Manliest peach ever. I think it's very manly. He's very secure in his masculinity. I mean, if you were ri that ripped, you'd be pretty secure in yours too. <laughs> oh, okay. So you didn't have that problem with your lab. So that's good. I did, uh, I did actually see, this is interesting, but um, at my puppy class, I had heard in a previous uh, puppy class, I, I, the trainer had mentioned that goldens tend to have resource guarding problems. And I hadn't ever like, heard that because I've never owned golden retrievers, right? I just encounter them on the street and you're unlikely to uh, run into that problem. But then I directly witnessed it in class when Kiki was at class this past week with a, a golden who had gotten a hold of one particular toy and was really, really like acting out badly at, a, at the other dogs who came close. That was sad. That's got to be hard, hard to deal with. I've never had a dog that did that. It's got to be a hard issue to work with. And I had no idea that it was considered a breed thing. So maybe it was just the bias of this instructor. <laughs> I'm glad you like the preach bruise. Oh yeah, child prophylactic. Otherwise they'd eat everything. Um, most of the time, yeah, I believe so, Pendrake. I mean, it depends on the culturally, but I think Arabic ones are. I mean, it makes sense for the head wrap. To, to be what kind of like all one piece as far as like putting it on, taking it off, and keeping it in place. So it relies on its own wrap to keep it in place. Oh, your golden has that issue? Yeah. Yeah, Keekster doesn't do it. She just like wants to play tug if you try to get her, her toy. If she's got a toy or a bone and you want to get it, she's going to try to, like, either, one, switch to your hand and play with your hand, not in a way you would like her to, or she's going to try to play tug with it because she loves tug. That's why we're going to have to move to very durable toys. I got her a new toy last Saturday that she really enjoyed playing with in class, and it's a, it's a lamb toy. But then she ate its face off last night. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, it begins. She's going to start teething any day. And uh, and then Lamb had a soft sock weave kind of face, so she totally chewed it open. Oh my god. Yikes. Yeah, I'm glad I don't have that problem in our breed, that whole will eat anything. Most of my Shilohs have been super smart about not swallowing stuff. Like, they'll chew it up, and you'll be worried they're going to eat it, but then you'll find just the piece of it. They won't have eaten it. I shouldn't say that because, you know, Kiki's an outcross. For all I know, she's going to be the exception. 
All right, so let's make a, hmm, hmm. I've got a, an opportunity here to introduce two colors if I want. But, so I could make each of these little scarves a different color. Um, but uh, I am planning to make the swirls down here mostly blue. Although I'll probably work them up to white, but mostly blue. Um, and so if I put uh, blue here, that would that would be too close, probably too much blue in this area, especially if I want this to be blue. So I am going to go orange because I can't see much of this scarf. It's mostly buried. So we will go orange on these. Or sorry, coral, peach, whatever. Whatever this color is, it's orangey. It's pale orange, pastel orange. I, I say Arab just because Arabian Nights, Pendrick, and I always think of genies as connected with that particular, because I love the Arabian Nights. Um, I will always think of, uh, think of it that way, just because of the subject matter of this model. But I'm also not overthinking it, because it's a fantasy monster, so... Turbans are problematic just because they do tend to be, it's like one piece of cloth. And so if you're going to put a pattern on it, and it tends to be folded over on itself a lot. So putting any freehand on it is usually extremely problematic. I have, I own a, another model with a, with a turban. And I am tempted to do freehand on it, but I need to kind of really look at it. It's got a lot of folds, so it would have to have a very simple. Pattern. Hey, Ultra, how's it going? All right, we are genieing, genieing. All right, I think I want to start blue here, and I think I'm going to go in and use my teal color. I'm going to make the teal color closer to the lamp. So I will do a color shift. I'm just going to do a slightly different one from the first one I considered. I'm going to use a big brush for this. Because I want to get the color on fast and big. So let me get a little bit more paint down with my tropical blue. I might need to order another drop, another bottle of tropical blue. For those who are wondering, one of the more useful paint colors in Bones, as far as I'm concerned, as far as uh, I reach for it a lot and I'm almost out of my bottle, is tropical blue. I really enjoy this color. It's a great blue. Get my number three brush all limbered up here. We'll see if I put a little bit too much water in that. But the nice thing with the uh, the giant brush is that you can go very, very fast on the base coat. Those of you who have been watching my Saturday stream where I've been painting the Anubis, like speed painting the Anubis, um, no. So there's an example of bubbles. Got some bubbles there. If I decide I really, really, really am worried about those bubbles, I'm just going to go in and blow on them. And they'll pop. If they're tiny, tiny bubbles, I wouldn't even worry. They'll pop themselves. All right, now this we may take this blue up to a um, to kind of a, a white, a cloudy white, like we did with the other genie. But I'm gonna start with this blue and at least get a base coat onto it. I'll back up a little. Hey, Zachariah. But yes, yes, those are my my Patreon, my everything's. Thank you all. Thanks for the links, Quindy. Um, that's where you can find me. I am working hard on uh, my Patreon stuff. Of course, the wedding is being a huge disruptor on getting work done, but I will do what I can and uh, hopefully get everything to you guys by the end of this month. But I'm going to be so happy when I when the wedding is done and I don't have any like big disruptors. Dave was asking me if even if we're even going to go to Adepticon this coming year with the pupper and everything. I need to figure that out. I 
I wanted to enter Golden Demon this year. But I don't know how easy or hard it's going to be able be to find a pet sitter for Pupper. So I have to start working on that. That will be the one, probably one of the things I need to worry about after the wedding. Yeah, right. Well, I don't like delays, Bruce, because it makes me stress out. Because you guys don't mind, but I mind. And so I'm going to bring in this green here, and I'm just going to mush them together. Do, 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 do. Just easy wet blend. Put down one color. Start mixing in the other. Uh, make sure that you've got kind of a transition area where you can see them mixing together. Don't just stop at one place and uh, make sure that you you can see the blend, the transition. Then I may decide uh, to bring in the blue to shade the green as it gets there. And like I said, I may do white highlights across all of this. It'll help too to get that color transition. I'm just going to go right over the top of the lamp, you know that? There's no point in like really trying not to. You can always paint over it. So for the sake of speed, rather than tippy toeing around the lamp, just paint right over it. You do need to remember that it's there. So don't like forget it. And if you feel like you're gonna forget it, then go back in right after this is dry and you know outline your lamp in a color that you will remember. But when you are speeding, when you're trying to go fast, there's really no room to stop for fine detail. Just go and get your big broad brush strokes in and then worry about it later. Because base coating is boring, everybody knows it, and so you want to get it out. Um, well, yeah, scrying. I mean, it, it is a gray, so you know, you are going to like see the coverage a little less like white is going to give you a white undercoat is going to give you the best um, base coat in my opinion but I'm planning to put two coats on anyway so for me not a big deal And if I really am worried about coverage on this, then I would uh, essentially have put on a coat of blue first and then I would have done my wet blend over the top. And you know, I may need to, need to do another coat of wet blending, I don't know, we'll find out. But really the only places I'm gonna have to worry really are, are like the wet blended direct places like out here where I'm firmly in teal territory, I could easily just put on another coat of teal. Oh, Bryce, I uh, have a model. Where is my model? Do I have it still here? Yeah, I want to enter. I go back and forth on stuff, though. Like, this is not a guarantee, but I bought this model to paint for GD. I bought... This one. I love the critter. So... I like that one a lot. So I thought I would enter a fantasy single because I like a lot of the Age of Sigmar models. And mostly I'm just interested in doing a really good paint job on it. Not interested in really converting it or anything. I have a conversion. I had a conversion single, very heavy conversion single that I was working on before that was part of the, um, oh man, the uh, the first faction they came out with, the, the guys in the gold armor. I never remember what their freaking name is. Stormcast. Because um, I love the, uh, oh, David's got a huge head. David just sits, sits and paints all the time. Like he just, 
when he's not playing WoW, he's he's like you know when he's just watching like his uh, TV show or whatever, he's like got painting out. He's just really David is just really productive. Like he's got a couple things that he likes to do with life, and he focuses very well on them. And unlike me, who gets totally distracted by a lot of other stuff in life, it's uh, it's admirable. Yeah. Yeah, I think I could rock it too. I like it. I mean, it's the fact that it's got animal patterns and animals are a strength of mine. Um, I was really freed by the results of the last GD. What it proved to me is that I didn't have to go and try to convert something like super duper off the top. I still could win with just a really well painted model. And that was very, for me, that was very encouraging. Like, because sometimes I just think about doing a super big conversion fancy piece for GD and I just lose all urge to do it. Um, it's hard for me to sustain through that these days. So I'm much more likely to do just a very simple conversion or, um, or a stock model. And I like that it's not going to be counted against me if I choose to do a stock model for GD. Like that really made me happy. Um, about GD. I know a lot of people were grumpy about it, but for me, it levels the playing field a bit because I'm not a great sculptor. But I can paint, so. Haha. <laughs> See, I want to paint a perfectly painted like that. I think I can do that. But yeah, I mean, you're going to have people who are going to be trying to do that, right? They're going to be trying to paint a perfectly painted small model because of the skank. And that's fair. Go for it. Whatever. But for me, seeing some of the models that won that were just stock but well painted, it really did make me happy and make me want to enter GD. Whereas before I was kind of like going, do I really want to do this? I already have my two, so it's like I've already got the the, the statue. I've already got the... I, I don't... Uh, I have no illusions that I will ever win a Slayer. I don't think I have that much oomph in me. There we go. So you guys can see the color transition. So I've got, essentially my paint is thinned. So after I put it down, it dries very quickly. And this enables me to get my second coat on very, very quickly, even while the other part is drying. But yeah, I really like that model. I like that faction, Teclis' faction. Um, I forget what, it's, what they're called. Does it have it in here? Elven Venari, I think. It's the Ales. And I really, uh, I like their shtick. I like the critters. I even like the, the, the you know, I mean, big hats are a, a long uh, tradition of high elves, so I even, I'm okay. Yeah, I guess there is always hope for the sword if the skink can win, so you just never know. Like, I just want to paint something, like, really nice that I enjoy that I paint to the top level that I can do. Because that always makes me reward, that always feels rewarding to me. Paint a model that I really like. Letting that dry. I'm going to go back up to the bracer while my, my teal is still a little wet. I'm going to put a second coat in some of this other stuff. We can see the color composition starting to come out now. So the blue is mostly down, a cooler color, and the warm colors are drawing your eye up here. And then we've got a little bit touches of blue up here to kind of bring everything together. So that's color composition in action. You know, yeah, I just don't, like, I'm not going to, like, worry about it, Bryce. Like, if I'm ever meant to win a Slayer Sword, like, then I guess it happens. But um, I'm just going to set out to painting a really solid model because I'd like another demon. I really do like a lot of the Age of Sigmar stuff, so...
it's just an opportunity for me to paint some of it. The problem I'm finding is that David keeps grabbing, like he, he grabs the best ones. <laughs> I like, given we have we have different aesthetics, but like he just bought like the Witch Hunter box set for Warhammer Underworlds, and they're really cool. I would totally have, have grabbed that and painted it. Um, but he's he he grabbed it for uh, I think he wants to do a duel or something. I don't know. He grabbed or or a diorama. He's and so he's like he's got it because he's got a great eye for a good model, and because our tastes do run in alignment for some of the stuff. I'm like, damn it, I would have painted that for a unit, or, or for a, yeah, for a group. <laughs> yeah, the old world return announcement. Yeah, the old fantasy world, I know. That's where I came from. I miss it. Like, the one problem with doing the whole, um, what the way the world's split, you know, into different, like, levels like it is right now is that and I was talking to David about this but there's no sense of place like each plane of that where they're fighting on is has a different feel but I don't feel like there's like a strong sense of place in the world or for each army and so it it makes it difficult for me to get into the, like the world and the basing and everything so at least the elves have a pretty strong sense of place with the kind of the architecture and the little bonsai trees and things like that but it would be cool if we had a real world again with real landmarks and real cities and, you know, fluff and stuff. It's cool to have a sandbox, but sometimes the sandbox, I, I like to have a little bit of a starter, I guess. Yeah, we're going, we're going very pastel with this dude, uh, Roger, for sure. Uh, Kodiak, I don't want to. Uh, I've always been the person who wanted to, who wanted to paint something different than other people, you know, uh, like I just enjoy that. And so the fact that David is using those, I wouldn't want to do it. Also, if we're going head to head in a painting competition already, I just don't want us head to head that way. Like if one of us wins, like the other one's just going to kind of feel a little, Aw. you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. Um, it, it's just, uh, it, although it would be an interesting style comparison for us both to paint the same models, but no, I'm probably, I'm buying Cursed City, so uh, um, there were a lot of people who painted Cursed City last year, and uh, there's models in there that I really love, so I'll probably paint some Cursed City if I paint, like, something for a unit or whatever. Who knows? No, it's not a rule, Kodiak, although in general it's rare, but not unheard of for Games Workshop to award Golden Demons to the same model in the same category. Um, it has happened. If it if it's really evident that like, you know, if you've got two Gaskal Thrakas that are amazing and 40k single, then you're and, and everything else is not just not as good, then you're gonna award it, you know, two and two to that. But um, but in general Games Workshop likes to award different models. All right, got some blue around there. That's going to be the edge, so gold. Just kind of looking at what I've got here. I'm going to do the bracer here, and I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to do a blue backdrop and do coral and gold for the top. I could do it the other way around, I guess. I could do gold, but it kind of feels like it to me, like it's got some leather there or something. So I'm going to do it that way. Who knows? And I'll do gold rims. So we'll do blue here. But yeah, I haven't thought about 40K or, okay, I have thought about 40K, but the 40K project I would want to do is like, is a big conversion. And I just don't know if I have the oomph in me. It's a model, it's a, it's an idea I've had for 20 years and I still haven't done it. And I don't know that it would go over well at, at a Golden Demon anyway. Although I was like somewhat offended that there were not more Tyranids last year. So I, I am tempted to do it, but. Because I like Tyranids. I like the bugs. This is, this is the kind of mold line that sucks over the top of a gemstone, over the top of a round surface. You have to be real delicate. Yeah, 
Yeah, they're doing good. That sounds, seems like there's a lot of big production values on that one, Twisted Emma. Considering that they're fighting for uh, for eyeballs with the new George R. R. Martin thing. The House of the Dragon. Although I guess these days, since you know you can just stream on demand, you can watch both. You can binge watch both shows. It's a good day it's a good uh, a good time to be into a fantasy genre. That's that's I'll say that. If you're a fantasy nerd, it's a good time. And if you're a television watching nerd, which actually I'm not, so Hmm. That's weird. Didn't think that was skin, thought that was jewelry. Maybe I'm wrong. Alright. There's a little nodule here that I really didn't think was skin because it stood out really hard and instead I'm thinking now it is skin and I'll need to go back with the skin tones and catch it. That happens. Especially with a really ornamental model, you might not always get what is what until you start putting paint on it and then you realize maybe that you screwed it up, but it's not a big deal. It's, a, it's acrylic. We paint over things. <laughs> Rings of Power is the Wheel of Time we deserved, yeah. Yeah, I was tempted to watch it. Um, I'll have to, like, I don't know. Violence always puts me off, and so I didn't know how violent and nasty it was going to be. That's what keeps me from watching The House of the Dragon, too. It's like graphic stuff. It turns me off, so. So I'm going to do mostly this as blue. I'm going to put gold edges on it. And I'm going to do coral and, or sorry, peach and uh, gold studs here. Um, because the peach will not go over the blue very well, I'm going to paint, uh, underpaint it with a bit of white. I watched a lot of it, Kodiak, but I had to leave the room every time something nasty was about to happen. I just get upset with that stuff, so I can't I can't watch it. Alright, so I have some pure white out here, so undercoat those gems so that I can put a different color over the top without having to fight for coverage over the blue. Right, exactly, Rice. They keep just trying to like make you go, oh my god, even more. And, you know, there's an audience for that, but I just feel like it, it just is too easy to desensitize to it, and I'm, I'm not a fan so much. So I'm going to mix this up too, guys, I think. Um, I'm thinking, because now I've got orange over here and blue over here, and I need to think about this cloth here. I think I'm going to do tea. Let me, let me do the peach. Oh, oh, I need to mix up more peach. Oh, no. Well, luckily, I mostly remember how I did it, which was... Four drops of Lotus Orange, one drop of Magma Red, and a little bit of Clear Red with two drops of White. Imagination is scarier anyway. All right, we'll see how close that gets. Especially with the base coat, it's not actually that important to match the color perfectly. As long as you get close. But I think I'm going to be close, so yeah, real close. Pretty much good. And there's another mold line sitting here staring at me.
All right. Yeah, lore consistency is important. I keep kind of saying that. I actually felt, I always liked that. Like, that's why, uh, yeah, and, and that's why I feel like fantasy is a little bit looser. Because, like, the current world doesn't have a lot of lore behind it. The Age of Sigmar world. Not like the old world did. So, I feel like you have less lore-centric stuff in the fantasy side where you, you know, you have a ton of lore and canon behind the 40k world. Um, but, yeah... No, and that's the thing is like in the olden in the olden days when I was originally competing in GD, uh, you had to convert. Like, you had to convert. You had to do some sculpting. Um, and uh, I felt like sometimes that was just a bit. It made it hard to compete sometimes. Um, so I kind of liked that uh, that America rewarded slightly different stuff, but. I know a lot of people were disappointed, but at the same time, exactly that point that they make where you've still got to do an amazingly clean paint job, technically very good paint job, you know, so it's not like just conversion is going to get you there. You have to paint it to that standard. So that's, that's fair. I mean, I can convert. I just don't enjoy it. Like I know a lot of people who love doing conversions. Love, love, love. Love it more than painting. And that's not me. I always prefer the painting. But yeah, I'd say that's fair, Church and I. That sounds pretty... Uh, yeah, have fun with your food shed, Raven. Yeah, clean and sharp paint jobs. Technically very high quality paint job is really GD. And you know what? That's the only competition that like really reaches for that. And so I'm happy about it. Um, I mean, the biggest complaint I think that I hear from the community at large in general these days has more to do like they wish, they feel, it feels to me like they wish that Golden Demon was a crystal brush replacement. It's not that. You're going to have to get something totally different for that. I mean, Golden Demon has never been that kind of thing. So um, I think that people here in these states would be happier if we had a high-end painting competition similar to crystal brush again. Because a lot of them want to, they want to go like way over the top, not be constrained by a manufacturer and uh, or a particular style. They don't want to paint to a particular style like Golden Demon wants you to. That's fair. I like having boxes to work within. Personally, I feel it frees me creatively. Like it's a challenge for me to work within a box and still do something that I really like. But a lot of painters don't see it that way, so. Yeah, you love converting, Bryce. I know. You love the sculpt and the convert. And a lot of guys I know are like that in the hobby. Um, a lot of the guys I used to uh, work with when I was at GW USA were like that. They really didn't like painting. They they loved building and converting. It was what they were in the hobby for. A lot of the guys who worked at GWHQ. I saw an awful lot of armies of, uh, of, of gray plastic, uh, but converted amazingly when I was there. Whereas I just like the paint. I like the paint. Paint is my comfort zone. I've learned enough conversion to to do it, but I love my colors, darn it. I love my colors. I don't remember. Like it was a long time ago. Like Joe Sloboto was doing articles for White Dwarf when I was at GW. It was that long ago. He was the one, like, painter that they had doing stuff. And uh, most everybody else, like, I was very, very surprised and kind of disappointed when I went to, went there and there were really, like, people were not really into painting. It was rare. Or they were they, they were into painting just to like like how can I do this fast and make it look decent? So it was much more of a speed painting focus, a fasting good.
Yeah, the limited palette uh, stuff in the RCL is really uh, useful. For that, for that reason, I'm glad it's helping merger. Well, people were asking me about pastels all the time, and I was like, you know what? I'm painting a genie, and the last genie I painted, I painted in pastels. So this genie I will paint in pastels, just different pastels. All right, so let's get this white going here. This is also a color palette that we've never used before on the show, so... Although I've been doing more orange lately, I don't normally do pastels. And I'll have to swatch this out on the back side of my skin guide for this guy. Just to remember how I built the, uh, the uh, coral color. Alright, need smaller brush. Get my white. This is very much a color composition uh, episode today. Kind of building up. And now we can see that the blue and teal will work on this bottle here. In fact, I think I'll do that after I get these uh, gems kind of blocked. little bit blur. That's all right. All this stuff can be touched up, so. I mean, this is really a don't sweat it lesson. This is very much blocking, so if I get a little bit of bleed because my white went over, oh well, tough, no big deal. So I'm putting this white down because the, um, the coral color, because it has less coverage, is going to like want to go gray if I put it over this blue. And I don't want to have to fight that. So I'm just... Uh... Putting down white first so that my coral will go on very nice and solid. Nobody likes pastels, but they're very pretty. They're very pretty colors to paint with. Oh, I hear a puppy. I hear a puppy. She's starting to wiggle around in there. There's no barking and howling yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Although it is actually time, so... I'm just going to finish blocking these in. There. Let's put some... Uh, Move our teal here. There we go. Oh, now the whiny. The whinies have come. She's like, hey, 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 it's time to take me out. It's time to play. Hey, people on this stream are the ones who asked for pastels, so you guys can make fun of it all you want, but it was an honest request, so. Oh, there's the howl. The baby howls. They're coming. I'm going to paint the bottle in blue, although it'll end up being mostly black, but or black, white, but I'm going to at least block it in. I 
We're not going to do fluid filled bottle because it's got that wrap around it. So it'd be actually um, difficult to do. It is otherwise a good candidate for a fluid filled bottle since it's up against the model. But we have already done a fluid filled bottle. So if you want to know how to do it, go look up the half orc wizard that we did uh, last year. I think, I think it was last year. As she has a fluid filled bottle. There we go. So that's color composition again. So we're interrupting, you got blue and then coral and then green, blue, and then more coral. Hey, hold your horses, Pa. Hold your horses, Papa. Just never close your mind to it. You never know when you're going to be painting something that, that might actually work with pastels. And remember also that, I mean, you want to vary your lights and darks on the model. So if you've got darks and mids, you may want to add a pastel in as a, uh, for color composition purposes. So doing that white first makes our coral color come out much better. So like, it's not necessarily about like thinking about painting with a pastel, but painting with a lighter version of a color because you otherwise have dark colors on the model and you need to switch it up a bit. Because most, I would, I would go out on a limb and say, almost all beginning and most intermediate painters I know do not vary up their lights and darks as much as they could. And their models would look a little better if they did. Yep, it's definitely a squeaky kiki. She's gonna start attacking her crate soon. Hang out, Papa, we're almost ready. All right, I'm gonna swatch this color. And put down my ratio. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to write down my other two colors because they're not very different. So this is four to, I'm going to say four to one to one half. Um, Lotus. Magma. Clear red. And then I've got 94, 16 spectral, more or less, and uh, 94, 19 tropical blue. Ah. Almost done, Pop. He's listening. She's like, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Here's my tropical. I'll just do that in there. Oh, we're pounding on our crate. We're pounding on our crate. We desperately want to be out. There we go. There we go. Got our swatch colors. Got a lot of our stuff figured out here. This will all change as we add in our gold and silver. Um, oh, I missed a, missed a blue spot there. Oh, um, I just use like, I squeeze a little bit out and then just push the nose of the bottle against the side of the pat, the well, Bryce, and then I get the half. Uh, it wasn't a full drop. I'll sometimes also squeeze out a little bit and then just smear it on my brush and put it in. I call that a half, but it's, you know, it's eyeballed. But when you're dealing with a big paint well like this, you know, as long as you're more or less, like when you've got like six or seven drops of fluid in here, as long as you're more or less the same, it's not going to make enough of a difference if you're a little bit more, a little bit less with one half of a drop. 
And that's why I've got the swatch, so I can directly compare against the swatch and just kind of put a dab of the new mix and make sure that I'm close. There. Forgot that blue part there. There we go. All right, let's back up and look at this dude. Yeah, he's all fantasy and stuff. Look at him. Dang. So yeah, as we get our silver and gold mapped in, that will help to further ground the model. Uh, and as we shade and highlight these colors, they're not always going to look so very cartoon, right? Once we start really bringing up white over the, the mist down here and bringing this way up, um, we're going to, you know, be adding in gold and steel in here. Um, we're, you know, we're going to be shading our oranges maybe with reds, maybe with purples. Um, you know, we, we could do that. So we're going to be changing a lot of these colors. Colors never exist in a vacuum. The base color is never like exactly the way, like it's never going to look exactly like this. It's you're going to add shadows and highlights. It's going to change it a little bit depending on how much area you cover with those shadows and highlights. So this is just like a very, very straight up, like just like dab kind of color scheme right now. And it is going to alter. So if I feel like the orange is too much, then I just need to shade it more and highlight it more. And that will tone the orange down a bit, uh, things like that. So, that's okay, Bloodwrath. Uh, it's really late, actually. I'm about to end the stream. But we put in some, we decided, I decided to go pastel on this guy. So, we were doing kind of a color composition talk a lot today um, about spacing out colors. I haven't done a lot of different stuff back here, but essentially alternating colors, trying to make sure everything is... Um, kind of alternating, talking about a bit of the future where we're going to be adding in metallics to this and uh, using shading and highlighting to tone down or bring up various parts of this model. So, yeah, there we go, guys. And we've got our swatches so we can remix our colors. Excellent. Thank you all. Tomorrow I will be mouse slinging. Mouse slinging. Um, we will be working more on mapping in his colors. Uh, getting everything in shadow and then starting to bring up our highlights on ye old mouseling. Um, again, a reminder for those who just tuned in, I am getting married this coming weekend. I will not be on Thursday, Friday, Monday, or Tuesday. I will be on this Wednesday and then I will be on the following Wednesday. So I will not be on and I will not be doing my Saturday stream. And my puppy is saying bark, 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 bark. And yes, Rhonda is on today. So definitely come back and hang out with Rhonda. All right, guys, thanks very much, and you guys have a fantastic day.